Dorian stood in the long check-in line at the airport, looking at the beautiful profile of his charming wife, Salome. She was one of those rare people whose profile was even more beautiful than the front view. He not only loved her, he adored her. He looked for her for a long time, but she was worth every second of waiting. He couldn't help but smile at the sight of her boyish hairstyle, cute button nose, and chiseled lips. What's so funny, Dor? Salome asked him with a soft smile, without turning her head. It's okay, Sal, you're just amazing, he said proudly, looking at her long, muscular legs, which were beautifully emphasized by her yoga pants. Their relationship had its ups and downs. Dorian was a difficult person. He was a man of principles. Not many people could live up to his high moral standards. Sal was the only such woman. She was a complicated person herself, an uncompromising vegan, a minimalist, an environmental fanatic, and a shelter volunteer. It would be fair to say that if they had not met each other, they would probably have remained single for a very long time. They were introduced two years ago by a mutual friend, Betty. Sal and Betty have worked in the legal department of a large advertising agency for the past ten years. Betty first dated Dorian. The spark between them ignited instantly, but their opposing worldviews and Dorian's complete unwillingness to compromise made the continuation of their relationship almost impossible. However, they ultimately remained good friends. It wasn't difficult for Betty to introduce him to her best friend Sal. They weren't a perfect couple. Dorian was just a vegetarian, not a vegan. He belonged to the right camp, and she belonged to the left. He loved dogs, and she loved cats. His Belgian shepherd didn't like her ginger cat. He preferred to spend time alone with her, while she preferred communication, parties, and parties. However, the commonality between them overcame their differences, and love blossomed in the blink of an eye. Ten months after their first date, they got married. In two weeks, they will celebrate their first wedding anniversary. Sal stopped using birth control a month ago. They were ready to have children. Dorian worked as a department manager for a large security company, a job given to him by one of his former army commanders. His service was shrouded in secrecy. Whatever he did for his country, he did it very well. He left the service at 27 after suffering too many losses. Despite this, his commanders and contacts were happy to help ease his transition to civilian life. However, he was occasionally called up for active reserve duty. This usually happens three or four times a year, unexpectedly, but not for long. Luckily for him, it usually only lasted a few days. His friends and family knew not to ask any questions. Sal's upcoming trip was related to her work and was a very joyful event. Once a year, her company vacationed for four days and three nights at an all-inclusive resort, employees and spouses. In addition to 24-hour free alcohol, there were day and night parties with DJs, stand-up shows, small island tours, and special attractions. The company's management spared no expense. Dorian smiled adoringly at Sal when his phone rang. His smile disappeared when he noticed the ID number on the screen. Do not answer! Sal screamed hysterically. He scrunched his face in agony and shook his head, but pressed the phone to his ear. Yes. Yes. I understand. I'm already on the road. No, said Sal. I'm so sorry, Dor whispered honestly. You know I have to go, but hey, have fun for both of us, okay? Sal nodded, clearly depressed. He kissed her quickly, turned, and left the terminal. Sal followed him with a longing gaze when she felt a gentle hand on her shoulder. It was Betty. You and I will have the best time of our lives, she promised her best friend. From now on, you're stuck with me. The flight and drive to the resort were relatively short, and check-in went smoothly. Luckily, Betty and her hotel roommate, Lisa, had a room not too far from Sal's. Sal's breath caught when she saw the breathtaking deep blue bay, perfectly visible from the balcony of her room. The resort's rooms were scattered in rows on the hillside that sloped down to the beach. This is where all the restaurants, bars, clubs, and sports facilities were located. Fortunately for Betty and Sal, their row was not located high on the hill. 
Otherwise, the climb back up the stairs could be tedious. After a quick shower and change of clothes, Sal met up with her friends, and they went down to the dining room to have lunch. Then they skipped to the bar. They were very excited and in high spirits when they returned to Betty and Lisa's room. Oscar and Ben, the young copywriters who lived in the next room, entered uninvited with mischievous smiles. Oscar pulled out a huge joint and asked if they wanted to celebrate. The girls giggled and nodded in delight. Where did you get this from? Betty asked in surprise. The employee who brought us our luggage asked if we needed anything else, Oscar replied smugly. This is the mood for the whole time here. Ben set the mobile speaker on the coffee table and set up his phone's Bluetooth while Oscar lit a joint. He took a deep breath and then passed it to Sal. Melodious. Techno began to emanate from the speaker as Sal exhaled. A pleasant dizziness overtook her almost immediately. A forbidden thought occurred to her. If Dor were here with me, I would not be sitting in this room with my friends, enjoying the beautiful grass. Dor drew the line at alcohol and was quite strict about it. He hated feeling like he was out of control. I wish he would relax a little, Sal thought. She passed the joint to Betty, nodding approvingly that it was good stuff. Soon they were all chatting uncontrollably, giggling and laughing. Well, almost everyone. While most people become talkative after smoking, Sal tended to withdraw into herself. Adding alcohol to the mix only made her quieter and more withdrawn. She sank into a chair with her eyes half-closed, slowly shaking her head and shoulders, enjoying the music and the pleasant massage sensation that ran through her entire body. Ben went to his room and returned with bottles of vodka, lemon juice, and disposable cups that he had bought earlier at Duty Free. Betty made sure Sal got her drink in a glass. Sal didn't accept any plastic. After toasting, they began to slowly dance to the soothing music in the room. Their holiday started off right. Later that evening, a group of five people sat around a communal table for dinner. Sal and Oscar were engrossed in each other and couldn't stop exchanging flirtatious glances and smiles. When this continued at the bar, Betty felt like they had lost interest in the rest of the group. Sal was in her room getting ready for the beach party when Betty suddenly walked in. Care to tell me exactly what's going on between you two? Betty asked without beating around the bush. Nothing, actually, Sal answered with some embarrassment. It's just nice to get a little attention from men for a change. No one dares even look at me when Dor is around. He scares the hell out of them just by existing. Nothing? Betty asked skeptically. I don't mean to sound nasty, Sal said, but I'm kind of glad Dora isn't here. He's so tense all the time, even when he's pretending to be cool, and it stresses me out. It's nice to feel free for a change and have a little fun. If he were here, I wouldn't be able to hang out with you guys in your room, and I certainly wouldn't smoke or drink more than a glass of wine. He's always so serious and cautious that it's boring. For example, when we sit in a restaurant, he always sits with his back to the wall and nonstop scans the front and back entrances. He thinks I don't notice, but even when he's supposedly talking to me, he constantly looks at other customers and even pedestrians outside the restaurant. Well, today Oscar gives me all his attention. Oscar is not playing the eternal game of agents and spies. It's not really a game, Betty said sternly. It's not just that Dor is used to behaving this way. There is a danger that someone might be following him. I know, but he's not here now. He left, and I was left alone. So now I have a few days to really relax. This is my first chance in two years to relax a little, and I'm going to make the most of it. Just be careful, okay? Certainly. Later that evening, Sal came into Betty's room again. She could hear muffled voices coming from the beach. She wasn't surprised to find Oscar and Ben sitting next to the coffee table, holding drinking cups and smoking weed. When they saw her, their jaws dropped. She wore a short black dress with straps that didn't leave much to the imagination. The two stoned men were literally drooling. Sal could hear a bunch of sounds coming from the bathroom. Betty and Lisa were preening there. Oscar offered Sal a drink and a joint. When Betty and Lisa finally emerged, Oscar and Ben exchanged knowing glances. They felt like the happiest people on the island. There was a full moon that night. 
the beach festivities hardly needed any extra lighting. By 10 p.m., many of the revelers could barely stand. Open bars made everyone too drunk. Betty's company felt much the same. In addition to being drunk, they were slightly overheated. Oscar wouldn't leave Sal's side, and Betty didn't like how Sal let him hug her here and there. Ben desperately tried to make some moves regarding Betty and Lisa, but he was constantly stopped. There was nothing personal about it. They did the same to every man who stumbled and took his shot. No matter how drunk they were, both Betty and Lisa knew that dating a co-worker was a bad idea. As midnight approached, the DJ started playing melodic techno and the gentle, sensual beat really heated things up on the sandy dance floor. Oscar and Sal slowly walked away from the rest of the group to the edge of the crowd. When they thought they were anonymous enough, they moved closer and she wrapped her arms around his neck. He responded by wrapping his arms around her waist and placing his hands on the small of her back. In addition to the drinking, smoking, and sensual dancing, there was another factor that made this evening deadly for sale. Estrogen levels in the body were at a monthly peak. She was ovulating, and so she was very excited. At some point, Sal stopped caring about Dora, Betty, Lisa, or anyone else. All she was fixated on was releasing the pent-up sexual tension that had been building up inside her throughout the day and had reached a truly insane level. When Oscar pressed his pelvis against her, she shuddered so hard that she was afraid she would reach her peak right there on the beach. She turned and pressed her back against him, allowing him to wrap his arms around her hips. He buried his nose in the back of her head, and she felt his arousal. At some point, she just couldn't take it anymore. She grabbed his hand and pulled him along to the shore. When she thought they were far enough from the party, and especially from Betty's prying eyes, she pounced on him with a wet and passionate kiss. We won't go all the way, she thought. We will please each other just once and call it a day. Follow me, she whispered in Oscar's ear. She quickly walked towards the path leading to the stairs, and he followed her. She ran up the stairs without looking up, fooling herself into thinking that if she couldn't see the passers-by, they wouldn't see her either. After she and Oscar reached her room, breathless with both excitement and excitement, she had to hand him a magnetic card for the door. Her hands were too shaking to do it herself. Oscar did just fine. Both he and she knew what awaited them there. As soon as the door closed behind them, they began to devour each other. They kissed passionately for some time. The admiration she saw in his eyes pleased her vanity. She dropped all pretense. They had sex, then had sex again, then again some more. They tried every possible position, and she stopped counting how many times she reached the peak of pleasure, the mixture of drinking, smoking, dancing, and sex. Eventually took its toll. Sal simply collapsed from exhaustion on her stomach on the mattress and began to fall asleep. The next morning, Sal woke up with a terrible hangover, and Oscar was nowhere to be seen. At first, everything was in a fog. She didn't understand where she was. The first coherent thought that came into her head like a poisonous arrow piercing her temples was, My marriage is over. This terrible thought soon turned into panic. The guilt and shame were more than she could handle. What have I done? She wanted to scream, but couldn't. She pulled her hair, but she didn't have the strength. She ran to the bathroom to throw up, but nothing came out. She was so thirsty that she drank rusty water straight from the sink faucet. She then returned to her bed and collapsed. Wrapping herself in sheets, she cried bitterly. After a while, a gloomy thought came into her head and she ran out onto the balcony. Ha! Slope! She thought. It's a fucking slope! I can't even kill myself! Desperate and broken, she returned to bed and lay there for several hours, without moving. In all the possible scenarios she played out in her head, Dor would eventually find out what happened. The only option was to confess everything, but he probably wouldn't forgive her. Even if he forgives, their relationship will never be the same. Dorian won't trust her anymore, and rightfully so. She didn't trust herself. She honestly asked herself whether she could forgive Dor's betrayal under similar circumstances, and the answer was no. At breakfast, Oscar and Ben learned that they were no longer welcome at the girls' table. 
they were very disappointed, but did not make a scene. That same day, Betty and Lisa rented a car and drove to the other side of the island to see a landmark called Pink Beach. They discussed whether to invite Sal, but decided not to. She didn't show up for breakfast and lunch, so they assumed she needed time alone. On the way there, they picked up two young Italian fellow travelers. Pink Beach was in a secluded area, about a half hour's walk from the nearest parking lot. The effort was worth it. The pink sand was not only pleasant to look at, but also incredibly soft. On the way back, they stopped at a vegan restaurant and ordered takeout for Sal. They also managed to get her a couple of pills for the morning. At first, Sal wouldn't open the door for them, but after Lisa nearly broke down the door, Sal relented and let them in. She looked terrible. Disheveled hair, a swollen red face that spoke of many tears, and a stale smell that suggested that she had not taken a shower since the day before. Betty and Lisa pulled their friend into a long group hug. It took a lot of convincing, but Sal finally agreed to take a shower and then eat something. However, she flatly refused to go down to the dining room with them. She didn't want to see knowing glances or hear whispers. Completely sober and unable to sleep, Sal spent a long and painful night. Her mind raced, asking difficult questions and giving no answers. How would she tell Dor? How much will she tell him? How can she convince him that it was a one-time mistake and that she is willing to do anything to make up for the mistake? Finally, after all the mental anguish, she came to a painful decision. She was a practical girl. If she was destined to lose her husband, she had no choice but to move on, despite all the grief she felt. The next day at lunch, Betty and Lisa were surprised to see Sal burst into the dining room in a flowery sundress, looking gorgeous and smiling. However, she avoided looking at the other customers. The dinner went well, and she even joined them for the final party on the beach that evening, but this time she avoided drinking and smoking. At two o'clock in the morning, Sal heard a light knock on her door. She didn't sleep. When she opened the door, she was surprised to find Oscar standing alone with a pleading look. She shook her head and closed the door. The next day, Betty, Sal, and Lisa stood quietly in line to check in at the terminal for their flight home. Oscar and Ben, standing behind them, couldn't stop chatting and seemed very happy. At some point, Betty couldn't take it anymore, so she turned around gave Oscar a sharp look and said, at breakfast, Oscar and Ben learned that they were no longer welcome at the girls' table. They were very disappointed, but did not make a scene. That same day, Betty and Lisa rented a car and drove to the other side of the island to see a landmark called Pink Beach. They discussed whether to invite Sal, but decided not to. She didn't show up for breakfast and lunch, so they assumed she needed time alone. On the way there, they picked up two young Italian fellow travelers. Pink Beach was in a secluded area, about a half hour's walk from the nearest parking lot. The effort was worth it. The pink sand was not only pleasant to look at, but also incredibly soft. On the way back, they stopped at a vegan restaurant and ordered takeout for Sal. They also managed to get her a couple of pills for the morning. At first, Sal wouldn't open the door for them, but after Lisa nearly broke down the door... Sal relented and let them in. She looked terrible. Disheveled hair, a swollen red face that spoke of many tears, and a stale smell that suggested that she had not taken a shower since the day before. Betty and Lisa pulled their friend into a long group hug. It took a lot of convincing, but Sal finally agreed to take a shower and then eat something. However, she flatly refused to go down to the dining room with them. She didn't want to see knowing glances or hear whispers. Completely sober and unable to sleep, Sal spent a long and painful night. Her mind raced, asking difficult questions and giving no answers. How would she tell Dor? How much will she tell him? How can she convince him that it was a one-time mistake and that she is willing to do anything to make up for the mistake? Finally, after all the mental anguish, she came to a painful decision. She was a practical girl. If she was destined to lose her husband, she had no choice but to move on, despite all the grief she felt. The next day at lunch, Betty and Lisa were surprised to see Sal burst into the dining room in a flowery sundress, looking gorgeous and smiling. 
However, she avoided looking at the other customers. The dinner went well, and she even joined them for the final party on the beach that evening, but this time she avoided drinking and smoking. At two o'clock in the morning, Sal heard a light knock on her door. She didn't sleep. When she opened the door, she was surprised to find Oscar standing alone with a pleading look. She shook her head and closed the door. The next day, Betty, Sal, and Lisa stood quietly in line to check in at the terminal for their flight home. Oscar and Ben, standing behind them, couldn't stop chatting and seemed very happy. At some point, Betty couldn't take it anymore, so she turned around, gave Oscar a sharp look and said, You look very content for a man whose days are numbered. You must disappear as soon as the plane lands. Dorian will take his time until he tortures you to death. With his connections, he might even confess to the murder and still go free. Then she turned to Ben. He'll probably think you were an accomplice, Ben. I wouldn't be surprised if he was waiting for you at the airport when we land. Both became white as a sheet. They didn't know anything specific about Dorian's military background, but he was still the biggest, baddest guy they'd ever seen. Sal called Dorian and insisted that he not pick her up from the airport since Betty would take her home. Sal thought Dorian would probably know something was wrong as soon as she saw her. She didn't want them to end up in a ditch on the side of the road. Dorian was preparing dinner in the kitchen when Sal entered the house. He dropped everything and ran to hug her and kiss her. He knew something was wrong when she avoided his lips and offered her cheek instead. An hour later, they ate dinner in complete silence. The tension in the air was unbearable. I have bad news, Sal finally said, her voice trembling. Doctor said nothing as Sal tearfully recounted the entire sequence of events. She didn't hide anything. She repeated and emphasized that this was an isolated incident, a combination of alcohol, smoking, a special day in her menstrual cycle, and that she would do anything to earn his forgiveness and a second chance. She was practically begging. When she had nothing more to say, Dorian stood up and asked gloomily, You said that Betty and Lisa drank and smoked with you. Did any of them end up in bed with a co-worker? No, but... He didn't let her finish her sentence. He rushed into the bedroom and began packing his gym bag. No! Sal shouted behind him. It's me who has to leave. Shut up! He hissed. Once he finished packing, he headed to the front door to find Sal standing there, blocking his way. Get out, he ordered. No, she begged. Please, please stay. He placed his large hand on her shoulder and easily moved her to the side. He was about to open the door when she clung to his hand with all her might and whined. Her tears and pain reached him, and he froze. Sal dropped her hand when she saw his broad shoulders shake. She raised her hand and almost touched his shoulder but was afraid, so she simply held her hand over his trembling body. She wanted so badly to hug him tightly and never let him go, but she knew that wouldn't help. She knew that if he ever decided to come back to her, it had to be because he wanted it, and not just because of an instinctive reaction to the sound of his wife's pain. He lingered, but eventually left. Dorian was heading to the motel when he suddenly changed his mind and turned around. He needed to hear another side of Sal's story from someone he could trust. He also didn't want to be alone. A cup of coffee was already waiting for him when Betty let him into her apartment. She confirmed all the details from Sal's story and added a few of her own, including Sal turning down an Oscar last night. She told him that Sal had not stopped crying for two days and that at one point she even feared for Sal's safety. She also begged him not to pursue Oscar because he wasn't worth the effort and said she doubted he would even show up for work on Monday. Dorian sat gloomy for a long hour, silently staring at the floor. Finally, he stood up, went to the guest room, and locked the door behind him. Betty didn't think now was the right time to ask him to forgive or move on. He needed time to digest what he heard. At noon the next day, Dorian had not yet left the room and did not answer her knock. Betty placed the tray of food by the door and told him she was going to check on Sal. Sal was in worse shape than she had been two days ago. It took Betty a long time to convince her to eat and drink something. 
Luckily, she was too weak and apathetic to resist as Betty dragged her into the bathroom. Closing the bathroom door behind her, Betty collapsed on the floor and burst into tears. The two people she loved the most were in a terrible situation, and there was really nothing she could do to help them. Dorian had not yet left the guest room when Betty returned from work the next day. She decided to prepare a dinner that included all of his favorite vegetarian dishes, in addition to a special baked salmon. She smiled to herself with pleasure as she heard his bedroom door open and then the bathroom door close. He looked almost normal as he sat down at the dinner table. He even smiled and talked more than usual. After dinner, they sat in the living room with a bottle of wine. What are you going to do? Asked Betty. I'll get a divorce. Isn't this too hasty? At the first opportunity that she had, she cheated on me. If you hadn't gotten those pills for her, she might now be pregnant with someone else's child. She made a terrible mistake, but she's only human. She won't repeat this mistake again. Damn it, he will definitely repeat it. Once a cheater, always a cheater. Do you really believe this cliché? Yes, definitely. She will never drink or smoke without you. I doubt she'll go anywhere without you other than work. It doesn't have to happen again under the same circumstances. It just has to be the right situation. Betty tilted her head and looked at him questioningly, but he simply looked at her meaningfully and smiled. Everyone deserves a second chance, she said. Not a third, but just a second. Sal deserves another chance. I'll throw her to the wolves myself if she slips up again. I've known her for ten years. She is a good person and she loves you very much. Even good people deceive and do bad things. They don't deserve special treatment. I really think you're wrong about this. Not just about all of us humans, but especially about Sal. We can all make critical mistakes when circumstances go right. Or wrong, I guess. Why didn't you and Lisa make a mistake? You're not even married. Well, not being married. We couldn't make that particular mistake. We certainly had fun, though. But not with your colleagues, and I'm willing to bet you use protection. Always bet on Betty you won't miss, she said mischievously. I'll tell you what, she said after a pause. Give her one more chance, at least for a week. If after this week you decide you can't continue, I'll understand. But at least try. For both of you. As well as for me. I love you both so much. I will agree to do everything to keep you two together. What? Anything. I have an idea but I don't think you'll like it. Do you want to bet? Sal stood in the kitchen, chopping vegetables for dinner. Betty had already told her that Dorian had decided to give her another chance and would return home that same evening. Hearing the front door open, she turned around cautiously. At first, Dorian stood at the entrance and looked tense, but as soon as he smiled at her, she dropped everything, ran up to him, jumped on him, wrapped her legs around his waist, and covered his entire face with kisses. He tried to avoid it the way one avoids being licked by a loving puppy. He simply patted her on the back affectionately. The dinner was pleasant, and Sal did not feel any displeasure from it. For the first time in a week, she felt happy and hopeful. That night, in bed, he politely rejected her advances. It's too early for me, he explained, and she understood. She didn't fool herself into thinking that in a moment everything would return to normal. She had all the patience in the world because she had hope. In the days that followed, they went out to dinner and shopping, cuddled on the couch in front of the TV every night, and even kissed lightly. Everything looked promising. However, on Friday night, Dorian dropped the bomb. They were sitting huddled together on the sofa in front of the TV when Dorian suddenly said, I have bad news. Sal flinched and then looked at him warily. When Betty convinced me to give you another chance he said in a cold voice without taking his eyes off the TV screen. It was on the condition that you would feel my pain. Salome tilted her head to the side in confusion. The only way for us to move on is if I get even. I'm sorry. What? Sal stuttered. I'm going to spend the weekend with Betty. If you can come to terms with this, then when I get back, maybe we can really start over. She would never dare to hurt me like that. She won't dare. That was my only condition, and she already agreed. 
I'll leave tomorrow evening and return Sunday evening, and then we can continue. No, please do not. This is madness. She is my best friend. Please don't do this to me. Dorian stood up and went into the master bedroom, leaving Sal sobbing on the couch. She eventually managed to fall asleep, thinking it was just a cruel experiment. They just want to test me, she told herself. This is just some kind of vile revenge. Nothing will actually happen between them. The next evening, Sal stood in her bedroom and watched her husband pack his gym bag. No need, she whispered one last time before he left the house. She ran to the living room window and watched him get into the car and drive away. Part of her still believed it was just a cruel joke. When she saw him drive away, she took the keys and ran to her car. Dorian had just entered the lobby of Betty's house when Sal pulled up. She parked next to the sidewalk in front of the building and looked up at the windows of Betty's apartment. She saw the dim light in the living room become brighter. She saw shadows of figures flickering on the walls. About twenty minutes later, the lights in the living room went out and the lights came on in Betty's bedroom. Another minute, and the whole apartment was plunged into complete darkness. Sal thought she saw the curtains in the dark bedroom move, but she couldn't be sure. No one heard Sal's painful scream. She returned home in agony, tears streaming down her face. At first she tried to convince herself that this was the price she had to pay for her infidelity and tried to think about something else to just pass the time. It was to no avail. My thoughts returned to my husband and my best friend. She imagined them pleasuring each other in bed, Betty's screams of ecstasy. She imagined her husband's adoring face as he looked into Betty's face, smiling contentedly at him. At some point, her self-torture turned into pure madness. She even thought about taking one of the guns in Dorian's safe and shooting them both in the head. But she knew that he had taken the key to the safe with him. He always did this. Yes, I screwed up big time once, she said out loud, her voice laced with disgust. But not with my fucking best friend, who also happens to be an ex. She called Dorian on his mobile, but he didn't answer. She then called Betty, but all calls went to voicemail. She even called Lisa, but received no answer. Sal was too out of sorts to realize how late the night was. Each failed call was a painful blow, another part of the conspiracy against her. Finally, in complete despair, she called Oscar. He arrived quite quickly and behaved like a real gentleman. He patiently listened to her desperate cries and explanations, handing her a glass of water. As she settled comfortably on his lap, trembling, he gently patted her shoulder. When she calmed down a little, he kissed the top of her head soothingly, assuring her that everything would be fine. When he saw that the first kiss had helped, he kissed her on the cheek. He certainly didn't resist when she suddenly kissed him passionately. In the bedroom, they repeated all their exercises from their last night together, but this time, it was even more exciting and enjoyable. For Sal, it was revenge sex, and there was nothing hotter. Only after the third time, they both collapsed onto the sheets and fell into a deep, sweet sleep. After some time, Sal woke up from her deep sleep because the light came on in the bedroom. Why does this idiot have to turn on the light when he goes to pee? She turned over in bed and felt a hand touch someone's body. If he's in bed, who turned on the light? She thought in horror. She propped herself up on her elbows and, narrowing her eyes painfully, looked at what turned out to be two figures. After a few agonizing seconds, her sleepy eyes finally managed to adjust to the light. She saw Dorian and Betty standing at the foot of the bed and looking at her naked body. Betty looked furious. Dorian looked down at Sal with pity and disgust, as if he were watching a gazelle being torn apart by a hyena. You owe me 500 bucks, he told Betty. Yes, I know, Betty answered coldly. You were right. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.